And so we return to the attenuator controller board and we ask the question, so after having built it, did it work? And the answer was, mostly. Indeed, for sufficiently low values of work, it was fine. Now, I did manage to get it to function quite nicely in the end, but only with the aid of a whole bunch of bodge wires and an extra gate on a breadboard. So, let's look into what went wrong. So the first sign of trouble was with the mute circuit, um, where I found that the LED was permanently on. That was fairly quick to trace, um, which was down to the set input for flip-flop number one. Instead of being tied high to five volts, that was grounded meaning that the output was permanently on. Now the intention there was to, um, to ground uh, the input for flip-flop number two, which is unused, so that I would drive that into a known state. Unfortunately, I got that a little bit there wrong, and so it was always gonna be stuck on. Now that's a fairly easy fix. Um, basically uh, desolder the whole chip, bend up that pin, and then run a bodge wire from there to the 5 volt rail. So having fixed that, I thought, oh great, now it's going to work. And of course, it didn't. What I found was that the push button wasn't actually inverting the state of the flip-flop. Rather, it had a weird sort of momentary action type of thing going on there, where it would change state on the button going in and then change state again on the button coming out. And I came to realize that my um, RC uh, debouncing circuit, which I'd gotten away with on the, uh, the input selector board using a 4017 decade counter and decoder, uh, wasn't working uh, driving the uh, clock input of this flip-flop. Now, a bit more digging, and you discover that the 4017 has a Schmidt trigger on its clock input. And so, sure enough, you can do crazy things like use an RC circuit, uh, and that's all fine. However, that flip-flop, uh, it's just a logic input. And so you really can't get away with having voltage levels that just gradually drift from one state to another. That's, that's not on. So fundamentally, the issue is this. If the output of our RC circuit is basically doing this, it's uh, rising quickly when the switch closes, and then falling slowly when the switch opens again. Our problem is that from a logic standpoint, we have logic high, logic low, and in between we have here be dragons. And having this just gradually make its way through this zone here is enough to completely freak that chip out. It starts thinking, hmm, am I seeing another upwards transition? What is going on here? So definitely can't get away with that. So if I'd chosen a flip-flop from uh, Philips or NXP, uh, they do them with a Schmidt trigger on the clock input and that would happily accept a signal that did that. That wouldn't be a problem. However, they're no longer available in through-hole and I really don't want to be designing in parts that are not currently available. That seems a bit silly. And for the moment, just for the purpose of testing with the board I've got, I've simply removed the capacitor altogether. It's not great. I mean, you've really got to push it fairly emphatically, otherwise it'll skip. Um, but for the purposes of testing, it'll do. So having gotten the mute circuit out of the way, and at least got it to a state where it wasn't permanently muted, I then turned my attention to the main event, uh, the pot driving the outputs, wherever they are. <laughs> where are the other outputs there? There we go. Now, what I found was this was sort of working. Unfortunately, it had a strange asymmetry to it, where when turning the pot clockwise, it would count slowly, whilst turning it anti-clockwise, it would count quickly. Or was it the other way around? Not that it matters. So that was unusual, and I really was having trouble getting to the bottom of what was going on there. While I was following through all of that, though, the other thing that I found was that my latch pulse was incredibly short. 
Um, and that was rather strange. In the process of fault finding, what I'd done is uh, I'd fiddled with the um, resistor and capacitor on the, on the clock to slow that right down. I'd slowed the clock down to five odd hertz so I could really just watch what was happening. Um, and what I found was that that latch pulse was still less than a microsecond in length, um, two to 400 nanoseconds, which was very strange. And I felt at the time that that was responsible for the problem I was having with the asymmetry. I'm, I now understand that that doesn't really make sense, but I found something that seemed anomalous and naturally I blamed all of my troubles on it. That turned out not to be the case, however. So the issue there is down to what's going on here. Basically, my problem is that the carry and borrow signals come on with the main clock. And for a counter in its usual application, that's exactly what you want. You don't want them to be occurring any later. Um, and so basically it determines on the half cycle before uh, whether or not this is going to be a carry or borrow. And on the main clock, it asserts the output. That's great, but it didn't help me with what I was doing. So here are my two clock pulses. Important thing here is that the uh, read is active low. And so from a little fraction after there, right up until there, there should be data available at the output of the A to D chip. So my concept was that we would have this compare pulse, which would come up well after we'd actually acquired our data and it would drop while it was still available at the output. So we had something to compare. So for some reason I'd convinced myself that I was going to get that latch pulse here um, on the downward edge of compare. But what actually happened is I got it here at the upward edge of compare. So what that meant was that I was still looking at the output of the comparators while I was changing the data out from underneath myself. And that just seemed like a really bad idea. So the fix to that issue is to, instead of using a NAND gate there, to use an AND gate, or indeed just to whack an inverter on there. So I did that. And that was great. And now my latch pulse was of a reasonable length. It all made sense. Everything was great, except my strange asymmetry was there still. Still found that turning the pot one way, it would count quickly, and turning it the other way, it would count slowly. So evidently that had nothing to do with it. At some point though, I looked here. So the intention with these inputs is that when we get equality from the comparator that we load the number 8 into the counter and so we're basically equidistant between a carry and a borrow. And as it turns out, I've got this completely wrong. A is actually the least significant bit. And so by tying that one high and the others low, instead of loading the number 8, I'm loading the number 1. So that's very close to doing a borrow and an awfully long way from doing a carry. Sure enough, that's the cause of my asymmetry. And the solution there, once again, is to desolder the chip and to bend up some legs and run some bodge wires. And that basically sorted the whole thing out. Now, all of these bits of information are really in the data sheet when I look more closely. Uh, looking at the flip-flop, sure enough, there's no symbol telling you that there is a Schmidt trigger on the clock, and so, sure enough, there isn't. Likewise, yeah, they're only labelled A, B, C, and D, and to me that's not entirely clear as to which is the most significant or least significant bit. But if you look at the diagram of the internals of the chip, it's pretty easy to see in what direction the flip-flops cascade, and that'll tell you which one is more significant than which. So, that's where we're at at the moment. 
So here's the amended schematic. What I've gone with is uh, that just looks like a, a NAND gate. That's actually a NAND gate with a Schmidt trigger, um, 74132. Indeed, I've decided to use that for all of the NAND gates, just to keep the bomb a little simpler. Now, I really only need uh, inverters here, but I've used these NAND gates with the inputs tied together. Uh, basically, as you know, you can crochet together anything you like out of NAND gates, um, and uh, that's what I've gone with here. So, uh, this being an extra inverter, these have to change a little bit. Um, these RC networks have to uh, work the other way to take account of the extra inversion, but that's all pretty basic stuff. Um, that little problem there um, has been amended. Um, we have our extra inverter here. It also incorporates a Schmidt trigger, but it doesn't need to, but that really doesn't matter. And that hopefully, oh yes, of course, the, um, we have uh, the input D tied high and all of the rest tied low. So we really are bashing the number eight into the counter on equality rather than the number one. So that's where the circuit is at the moment. Now I have designed a board for this and uh, I have ordered one that's been manufactured and it's very slowly, given current situation, making its way to me. So hopefully we'll see that soon. So that's our little update of where we are at the moment. Hope you enjoyed that and thanks for watching.